Thank you so much, sir. And uh, no apologies needed because I, I'm sure I speak for all of us that when you talk about Kandahar Nath, I think the, re, the all everybody who's here today can hear you speak about it infinitely. There's just so much to learn. And try as one may think that they know about Gandhara art, I think your lectures prove otherwise. There's so much that we have to learn and I'm eagerly looking forward to the next installment also now. So whenever you're ready, sir, we can start with the questions. I'm ready. Uh, shall I uh, uh, stop? Um, because then I can have the... The screen, yes, sir. Screen, yeah, no, I have the full screen now. I can see you. Okay. There we okay. go. So I have three questions listed out here. The first one is when it comes to comparative iconographies between Greco-Roman art and the Gandharan art, how much work do you think has already been done and how much work is still left to be done? This is something that I get asked a lot of times by my students. So I thought I might just ask you on their behalf. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. So much is done. I mean, from the time of Alfred Fouché more than 100 years ago, which they call, I mean, your tradition continued during the colonial period. You know, the famous book by W. W. Tans that saying that the Greeks came to India to civilize India, and also the other way around uh, during the independence, all the others were reacting against it, saying that we have nothing to receive from, from Greece. So this was there. People, it all depends how you look at it. What is your social and political and economic background? What Fouché saw, I don't see. And at the same time, what Fouché saw is a different interpretation of what he has seen in his background. So, so people have written much uh, Shia in this context. I mean, if you look at early early writers uh, like uh, Fouché or even um, uh, I mean, persons like uh, uh, Sir John Marshall, they see it in a different angle because it's so astonishing to see so many Greek elements in it. That's why they call it a Greco Buddhist art. So, if you look at the uh, Mathura, same period under the same Kushan Empire, and also if you look at the Ikshvakus um, and sorry, Satavanas and Ikshvakus in uh, Andhra Pradesh, it's also a different style. So, the, the Greek elements don't come into play. In Andhra Pradesh, you have some sort of a Roman inspiration, but not to that level. But here, you, you take any sculpture from Gandhara, there are Greek elements there. But the thing is, to study Greek art, you need to know many things. First of all, you need to know Greek and Roman art, and also uh, Persian, Scythian art, little, uh, I, mean, uh, of, I mean, and also Roman art. And on the other hand, you need to know the Indian art. I mean, starting from Bharut, what we know so far, Bharut, Sanchi, Mathura, Andhra Pradesh, Nagarjuna Konda, and, all, and also Kanaganahalli, all that. Above all, we need to know literature. It's something that I can't discuss now, but sometimes, I mean, in the next talk, I will discuss about it. So we, we have the tendency to, to see, or I mean, accept, we know everything about Buddhist art or Buddhist literature. No, we, we don't know anything. My talk, I mean, as you kindly mentioned in uh, Germany was that I was talking about the twin miracle of the Buddha. So we were all uh, taking the Mule Sravastava Divinia and also, uh, and also Narita Vistara and other, other things. But about a year back, uh, my good friend Harry Falk uh, published a, a new text written in Gandhari dated to first century to talking about the twin miracle. So that means this is before all the known texts like Lalita Vistara, um, um, Mahavastu, and Buddha Charita. So there is so much that we have. I mean, it's, I mean, that's why Richard Solomon say we are living in a golden age of Buddhist art. So many texts are coming into surface. So many inscriptions are found. So many Gandharan sculptures, the one that I present to was completely unknown. Stupa was unknown. So it is a huge, a huge, um, how do you call that? Um, a huge problem, not a problem, it's a challenge for the art historians and archaeologists to be aware, at least, at least to tap on the correct door. If you don't know the text, you should know, I mean, how you, I mean, who, the, to, you should know the experts of text and also the Greek and Roman art. So it's a huge challenge. I mean, it's a challenge for everything, 
I'm not saying do I mean only for Gandhar or not, but Gandhar and Pavat, especially we need to know also coins, the coin iconography, the history and everything. Thank you so much for that answer, sir. I think I get this very often also by some very senior archaeologists these days. You know, specifically when you come across those bowls that you were showing. So there's one at Lahore Museum, which I'm sure you must have seen. There's a gold bowl with Dionysius inside it. And I had somebody very senior in Indian archaeology uh, getting into an argument with me online about why exactly did I think it was Dionysius? Why couldn't it be somebody else? You know, and that's that just shows that there's so much to learn about the Greek art before you sort of delve into Gandharan art. You're absolutely um, uh, correct, Shriyam. The, I didn't show you all the uh, the plates now which are in a private collection and they were found in Afghanistan and Pakistan because I saw with my own eyes. And uh, so these were found in 1990s and they give a, a very Greek element. It's, they are not Gandharan art, these are Greek Greek elements and also the other, uh, other sculptures published by uh, Francois Barat, a French scholar with Harry Falk. And also, I'm sure Richard Solomon is going to publish more about it. So these Greek, I mean, also the things that we found in Tiliatepe and also Begram, they were not even made locally. Most of them were imported from the Greek world, Greek and Roman world. So one, I mean, it's very important to know, we need to get out of our, you know, the, how do you say, we, we are sometimes conditioned by our, religion, so nationalism or political ideas. We need to be, I always tell my students, we have to be free thinkers, not to be influenced by, by um, other, other things. And then you, you might see things that others can't see. Absolutely agree with you on that. I think a lot of this is now influenced by this excessive need, specifically when it comes to a lot of Indian scholars looking at Kandahara, there's this excessive need to Indianize it, you know, yeah. and not accept the fact that we may have borrowed an element from abroad. Yeah. So that is a mentality we sort of need to ditch now and get out of that mental tight corner, like you said. So the second question, sir, we have is, uh, I'm pretty sure it fits the next talk, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. So it says the Shal Banjika, which is the woman breaking the branch of a tree. Uh, she was originally a Greco-Roman motif, and then she eventually came to represent Maya Devi while she's giving birth to Buddha. And similarly, the woman holding a mirror or the Darpan Dharani, she eventually came to be interpreted as the Nanda Sundari or Buddha's sister uh, in a lot of Gandhara panels. So what were they originally meant to be in Greek art, seeing that the prototypes come from Greco-Roman antiquities? It's a very good question of Sala, I mean, Sala Banjika, the breaking the Sala branch. It's uh, it's not Greek. I mean, the, the concept, it's, it's in, the, in, the, in the Vedic literature. Um, but the way the first uh, Sala Banjikas in Indian art are in Bharut and Sanchi Stupas. And they are in a India, I mean, it's very, um, please don't misunderstand me. They are in an Indian context, but everything is not Indian in Sanchi and Bharut. There's a huge amount of Persian uh, inspirations there. To what extent, even um, I mean, you know, the whole Indian school of uh, um, art historians, even coming up to S. B. Gupta, even before them, so they also accept that uh, the the artists who worked for the Achaemenid Empire after their uh, uh, defeat, when Alex, um, the region was conquered by Alexander, they went to. Uh, Ashoka's kingdom and they started working for him. So there is a certain truth when you look at the, the monoliths uh, with the, the lion and other animals on the top, it's a Persian column. There's no doubt about that. So there, there is, I mean, there are some, some Greek elements in that, but mainly it's Persian back-to-back -back elements. So the first, uh, the, these images come from that. But its thing is the, the, the movement of the body of a woman and also the slenderness of the body of a woman, it comes from the Greek art. So it's a combi again, a wonderful combination of two elements. One is the Indian, um, uh, Indian literature, what, what you have and how it is depicted. Now, if you compare one Sala Banjika from uh, Sanchi, uh, you don't find Sala Banjika in the same way in the Gandhara, not except the fact that the, the, the Mahamaya is holding the branch of the Sal tree. Again, the Sal tree. It's not another tree, right? Sal tree in Lumbini. So it's always 
they are all connected in a very subtle way. That's why one has to be extremely careful not to say it is Greek or it is Indian. So there are so many things, and also that's why I'm. I mean, I always insist that we are living in a wonderful world today, and I am sure there will be more Kandari scripts, and they will enable us to so like the 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 manuscript that Harifal published recently enabled us to know more about the twin miracle, right? What is I mean recited in Pratyahari Sutra, the Vyavadana, and also in Moolisravastivadi Vinaya. You don't find on the sculptures. So they are as if there was something before that. There was a text before that. So we are we are trying to get closer to the truth. And um, it is quite interesting for the younger generation to come to get their formation and training in all these things and start looking at them. I mean, there is no need to, as you said correctly, if it is, if it is Heracles, he is Heracles. There is no need to see a Shiva in Heracles or Vishnu in Heracles. If he is Heracles, hold, the guy uh, nude holding a club and um, uh, having the, the skin of the uh, uh, lion, it is Heracles. But if it is Shiva, it's a different context. He can also be naked, but it has, he can also have... Uh, the, the skin of an antelope or a tiger it's a different context so there are certain things we are we are certain of so that you have to admit but always not to have this the colonial mentality or ultra nationalist mentality when interpreting as you correctly said this is becoming very uh, very stylish today especially some of my good friends in india uh, to deny everything and to see the uh, we are part of the history, and when we are gone, you will come, and you will do. You will continue. So nobody can stop that. So to to look at the history as a part of the history, out of the evolution, is very important. Absolutely agree with you on that, sir. I think also, um, like I, like we were talking about it also earlier, there's this whole tendency among a lot of people to interpret the Indian gods and try to assert that these were older. So this is something that we get quite a lot. So whenever we are publicly posting Gandhara sculptures, and there was this project that we were working on, which you, which you know about. So when we were working and posting all of these things, we got a lot of these comments where people were just not ready to accept museum provenances on certain objects. And there's this very interesting Shala Bhanjaka. Well, I wouldn't call her a Shala Bhanjaka because yeah. she's breaking a branch for palm tree which okay. you find yeah. in the northwest frontier province and it's currently at the Chandigarh Museum it's on display right. so I'll send you a picture of it there's no associated scene with it it's just a lady standing mm -hmm. on a lotus and, bearing, uh, and breaking the bark of a palm tree very palm clearly tree. Right, right. we got just so much criticism on saying that this is well this is a shal bhanjika and uh, this is a lady uh, breaking a tree uh, and not Shal Banjika. And uh, we eventually had to sort of correct the provenance on that. So right. we had to Shal Banjika just so that people did not come along and troll that. Yeah. But yeah. this whole tendency of not accepting that this could be foreign and it's yeah. perfectly normal for it to be foreign in, in a right. situation diverse and as dynamic as Gandhara was. Yeah. So that, that you are absolutely correct, Shreya. That's why I always start with the history. Uh, Gandhara has a history that Andhra Pradesh, I mean, Andhra um, doesn't have, because this region was, I mean, under the Achaemenids. So what Alexander did was to conquer the Achaemenid Empire. He didn't even know when he came to India that India continues further. So he came to this flat land thinking after that the water falls and this is the end of the world. Only then, as an intelligent person, he knew that uh, India for, was there. So it's, it's extremely, extremely important to know that in the mind. So this is happening in Gandhara, where there were Achaemenes, there were the, and there were Greeks and Alexander, and there were Myrans there. And again, the Greeks came in, Indo-Sidians, Indo-Parthians, and I mean, also uh, uh, Kushans. So much, what a rich area. So how can you deny if you have thousands and thousands of coins circulating in Gandhara, issued by Hindu Greeks, Hindu Sidians, Hindu Patin, Pushans, how can you say these regions were typically Indian? No, it is, for me, it is Indian because that's a part of the Indian history. 
like many parts of the world. So you can differentiate. Um, I mean, the the I mean, you can find, you can say everything is Indian in Gandhara. So it's it's, it's a, such a beautiful subject when you look at it in a very how do you say very objective way, not subjective way that, that uh, the 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 uh, how a story. Uh, this is what is important. The, the story is not it, not narrated in the same way we talk about. This. Like, I mean, I didn't talk today about the Hindu gods, but I mean, this is another subject in Gandhara. But if you talk about, take a take, but just take Buddhist stories. Now, mainly the Buddhist stories in Gandhara are much inspire, inspired by the Sanskrit texts. Before the Sanskrit texts, there, I mean, there, uh, there was Gandhari. Now we have no doubt about that. But if you look at Sri Lanka and, um, and the whole of Southeast Asia, like Burma, that's only Pali. And Pali way of reciting the Buddha is not the same way as the Sanskrit way. Now, when you come to Andhra Pradesh, you have both. And there are some scenes that you don't you don't find that no, 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 not in a single text known to us. Pali or I mean, Sanskrit or translation, Tibetan translations or Chinese translations. So th th that's why uh, I mean. One advice I can give you is not to be really adamant and say that this is the truth. No, leave space, leave a margin for error. It's, it's very important. Thank you so much for that perspective, sir. I think beautifully put. Uh, the third question we now have is, in your opinion, the presence of Greek elements in Gandhara art, is this a classic case of the artist making what he saw or what he knew best? Or was there a bigger picture here than just artistic influence? Very good question. <laughs> There's a bigger picture. So what, what do you do? Now, for example, in the modern world, right, look at something that modern artists do, how much they are inspired by all kinds of artistic forms. It could be Japanese, Chinese, or could be American, whatever. Right? So now in Gandhara, it was a region dominantly Greek. And they, of course, by the time Kushans came in, they have disappeared. But the traditions prevailed. The reason why Kanishka issued his um, the first coins with the Greek legend. So that means Greek was practiced and people could read Greek, right? So um, in 127, when he first year of, uh, of Kanishka. So there, there were Greek elements. So you have a story, the dream, dream of Maya. Simple, right? So what we know from the text, everybody agrees she was dreaming. She was lying down. And she dreamt white elephant with six tusks, uh, silver in color, you know, with uh, I mean, I mean, reddish things and appeared and all that. So elephant, uh, elephant comes and she, she dreams, not that not that the elephant entered. She dreams that the elephant entered into her womb. Now this story, um, I mean, I showed you what is in Bharat, but look at the one in Sanchi. Sanchi, she is lying in the Indian bed. And Indian architecture, the elephant is front. And in Greek art, as I showed you, you have a, a woman lying down on a Greek bed. And all the, I mean, uh, one of our colleagues did a, a thesis on the Greek uh, um, uh, Greek uh, textile motifs in Gandhara. They are almost, they are Greek. So it's, uh, so for these people, I'm sure during the time of uh, Kushans, they still had now, if you go to a Bangalore in, um, in, in, uh, in Kashmir, or if you go to Shimla, or other places, most of the things I have seen in India, they are all British still, right? If you go to Tamil Nadu, it's a different style. So that's the beauty of India at the same time. So in these places, what they have, on the, they have Greek beds, right? They had, I mean, even the way that they drink, the drinking cups, what you call the, I mean, the, the different types of drinking cups, and they were all there. So they take all these elements, and also the stupa should be beautiful, should be attractive. So they put everything there, all these makaras, and then the hybrid creatures, fantastic animals, and then they put palmet motifs and the, the grape points, everything. So it's all the what they had. I mean, of course, as I showed you, um, um, as in the, today, the Greek techniques continue. The, technique of making acrolytic images, right? And most of the, uh, the, 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 even the Buddha looks like Apollo, that those are true things, right? So they take what was there and the Andhra artists took what they had there 
and Mathura artists did what they had in Mathura. So, um, so, so in Greece, so by, by this time, so we are talking about the second century, there was the Greek heritage and the trade was very important because the Romans were coming to, uh, to Afghanistan in this time. So the, the, the decisive element is background. The amount of things that they found imported from Alexandria. So it's a, it's a very large picture of uh, what was going. So, so the person who commissioned the sculpture or a stupa, um, he, he can say, I want this and this. Right? I can and say now, for example, Sanch, it's very clear, Chaddanta uh, Jataka, you know, the elephant with the six stars, with two, I mean, two wives, two elephants. That story was so popular, you have three panels in three different places. And also Vesantra Jataka, they decide to have on the front and the back. So it's all the preferences of the, uh, the person who commissioned, the person who gave money. And then you have the artist who had basic knowledge, either he was advised by a monk. I mean, this is what people say, which I doubt. I think monks had many other things to do than giving advice to a sculptor. These sculptors were knowledgeable. I had the same experience in Sri Lanka while I was doing this work on Sri Lankan paintings. One day I went to a remote village. I mean, he, he had these beautiful paintings and there were some exceptions that you don't see elsewhere. So I asked him, how, how come? This is, he said, this is my imagination. I don't, I know the story, but this is how I want it to be. I want Siddhartha, the prince, to, to look like this. So it's, uh, it's always, that's why we get so many uh, uh, different schools in that. Uh, and we, we speak about Taxila, we, we speak about Peshawa, we, and also uh, Saidu Sharif, and also uh, um, uh, other places, and also then you come to Hadda and other places. That's why the schools are there, and different styles are there, and also different ways of depicting the same story. Absolutely true. I think a lot of us don't know this yet, but there are schools within the Gandhara school. I think the whole problem with the way that we're taught art history today specifically with respect to Gandhara, is we club it into an umbrella term. So it's Gandhara school of art. And people don't know that there is a Takshila school within Gandhara or there's a Peshawar school within Gandhara. And people don't look at these cultures that way also. So I think the picture that you clearly illustrated right now generally sort of eludes the modern eye because they look at it as an umbrella term. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is sure one day we should have this discussion so we theorize and we interpret most of the things about art. And the, the worst is that these things were not to be seen by ordinary people, right? Now I'll give you one example. Um, uh, now we talk about, I mean, I discussed mainly some of the relic chambers of the stupas, right? So those where we have the relics of the Buddha and the, all the walls were painted, beautifully painted. We found them in Sri Lanka, um, as, um, which I, one which I have written. but. They saw them on the day that stupa was, I mean, uh, consecrated. And after that, they covered it. And after that, nobody saw them, right? It's like a pyramid. People think that like tourists today, you go into the pyramid and, oh, yeah, who are you? This Ramses is there, Ramses. No, 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 they were completely closed. So what we call the sacred space. But they did a wonderful job. Those people who those, did those paintings, Right in pyramid or a stupa relic chamber, they did wonderfully. So that's what we call the merit purpose of art, of art. That people seem to forget that even looking at Sanchi, if you go to Sanchi, I mean, North Torana, Vieni Torana, can you see all the details from the front side? You can see from back if you come climb up. So it is not, it's not for educational law just to see that it is there. But people who did that, they did it purposely, beautifully for the merit purpose. Same thing with Tajanta paintings and all that. You know, this, the, the, they're so beautifully done, but how many people saw them? So that's that's something that we all need to, and also another thing, Shri, I'm sorry for taking so much time. Other thing that people forget is that they were all painted. They just forget that all the sculptures we see with naked, uh, nude uh, stone, did was were not there at originally. Even the cathedrals in France or in the whole Europe, they were painted. All the pyramids were painted. All the I mean, even the Parthenon and everything, they were 
you know, the people are doing, um, ex I mean, experiments with the pigments, remaining pigments. So they were painted. So leave space. I always ask young, I mean, young students, leave space, leave margin for error. So, I mean, it's, 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 that's the beauty of art in the same way. Absolutely, sir. I think the margin, I think this very lecture illustrates that fact because um, like I said, we were documenting a few sculptures and the student of mine who was documenting it with me, yeah. we were just going through that, you were just going through that bit where you were talking about the, the sculpture, the relief panels on the staircase. Yeah. And we've seen so many of them in Chandigarh Museum. And for the life of us, we could not imagine where exactly in a stupa would this have fit. And now it makes perfect sense. It would have been on the stairs. If you look at it, the way it's been aligned. And yeah. also because they measure almost equally the same. So even if they're broken panels, they measure the same. It yeah. makes so much sense that they would have been on stairs. So there's yeah. always a margin for understanding those things. You think you see it in a museum and you yeah. understand it in its complete magnificence. But that's not true. Yeah. So what should be done is, Shreya, that as I told you, that during the colonial period, they dispersed these sculptures. They are everywhere. For example, if you go to Calcutta, it's one of the biggest Jamalgari collection is there. And if you go to Chandigarh, so if you can do, I mean, the Indian scholars and I mean, also Pakistani scholars get together, do the database and to put all the, not to send all the sculptures to Pakistan or Pakistan wants to India. I'm saying we have the, now the possibility virtually to unite them. It is very important. So if you can encourage your students to do that in Chandigarh and also Calcutta, and to uh, go to the ASI, I mean, not the ASI, early, even before ASI, uh, reports, and uh, to see which sculpture come from which, uh, which place and which context. So we might be able to solve a lot of problems if you know the context where they were from. I think I couldn't agree more on that, sir. I think the only problem that one faces, and I think we've discussed this also personally, is some museums are very closed about their collections and letting researchers see them. Yeah. But hopefully we should be able to whip something up and I'll keep you updated on that. Thank you very much, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the next question we have, sir, is how much does geometry or symmetry hold influence in Gandharan sculptures? Um, I mean, if the person can precise more about it, the, um, what he meant by symmetry, uh, it's a symmetrical design Symmetrical. I think so. I think we have the person who asked it. So could you please clarify? I think until they type, we can move on to the next question, sir. Yeah. So the next one is you mentioned that the reliefs with the Buddhist narratives separated by the Corinthian pillars are like theater. Yeah. Could you elaborate on the influence of theater on the representation of these narratives? Yeah, very good question. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> The, the, the theater is something very, I mean, um, very much close to the Greek culture. As you know, I mean, if you go to Greece and also Asia Minor and the places, you get so many theaters. The fact that you have a theater in Iconum is, um, should be taken into granted, granted. So theater is something that you create space. That's something you can't see in your real life. So in, uh, when you go to the theater, even modern drama, you see things happening inside the house. Do you think that we can see them from looking at a house from outside? No. So what the theater does is to, to, uh, to, uh, to destroy the wall, separating, uh, separating us from what is happening inside and what, I mean, what, I mean watched by the people uh, in the other outside. So the theater aspect is put them into a scene. So where do you come the scenery the, the, from there? So in Gandhara, what they do is the columns, uh, of course, they are sequential. They follow order. There is no hazardously that you don't find if it is very, very well done, but in Nirvana first and the birth of the Buddha after. No. So they have a chronological order. So they have a text. So for, I mean, for it to be clear, so they separate the scene with the columns. Right, like in um, I mean Andhra Pradesh, you have the Mithuna couple. Here you have very simple, right? In a frame, you have a column surmounted mainly by a Corinthian capital, if not by a Persian Persian capital. Then you have a scene in the middle, for example, interpretation of the dream. So according to the story, 
when Maya dreamt that the white elephant entered her womb, she told these two uh, to the uh, to, to his husband, I mean to her husband, Suddhodana. So Suddhodana so asked all the Purohitas, you know, the sages to come and interpret the dream. So this was happening inside the palace, right? They were asked to come inside. So uh, the, the king is seated on a higher chair or a throne, and then the Maya normally on the lower chair. And you can see people um, interpreting the dream, having drinks, I mean, not drinks, I mean, that do and other things really so they were eating so this took place inside so now the artist wants to tell us or show us how it happened so first thing he does is he break the wall in front and make it i mean i mean for us to see that so this is happening there so that's that's what the theater, theatrical way of presenting the life of the buddha or other stories so Jataka stories in if you go to sanchi if you go to torana of the north torana where you have the west Jataka. Uh, on, on the front side and the back side, scenes are not separated. Scenes are not separated. Since if you have a good, I mean, knowledge of the story, you can follow the story. Although in Gandhara, it's very, very, very easy to see them. See them. The other second part of the question is that about the theater. So you need to, to I mean, to have a theater to have perform. You can also have a theater like the one that they found in Ipdar also or. Babylon or in uh, or in Afghanistan in Icon. But also there's another part of the, uh, theater, you don't need anything. Um, if go to India, come to Sri Lanka, or go to uh, Southeast Asia, uh, you just announce, of course, the, the television and other cinema, they kill that tradition to a certain extent, but still in a village, you just announce that, uh, you know, during the such and such day, they have their performance. So what they do is either you have a ground and you separate the people can watch surrounded and inside the troop, uh, the team uh, will uh, perform. Or you can have a temporary stage. I told this at Berkeley once, you know, when I was a kid, you used to perform with Santra Jataka for one week, right? And uh, so every day um, at eight o'clock when it is dark, we didn't have electricity, we had this petrol lamp. And uh, we had a lot of uh, makeup because you don't see the makeup. So you have to put about one inch of makeup on your face. So it was performed. When the, when the cycle is over, they destroy the platform. So the, the, uh, this is something we need to discuss more how it uh, inspired also the Indian theater. So the theater is a part of life. Why people still watch uh, uh, soap operas and television dramas? Because it's, it's a part of life. It's what, uh, so it was, I mean, the ancient time, you could see the people, right? And they, 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 uh, they performed in front of you. And this is also one of the reasons why people love actors. Right? Thank you so much for that, sir. That, that just puts the whole thing into a new perspective for me. So Nidhi Patel, who met you last time, asks, she's doing her research on the mythical animal Sharab, which is worshipped as an avatar of Shiv in South India. And it's also found in Buddhist texts in the form of a goat sometimes. Yeah. In Indic art, it generally has the form of half a lion and half an eagle. And she wants to know if it's possible that Sharab developed from the griffin. Yeah, this is a very, very interesting question. Once again, I'll be very careful when I uh, when I answer. Um, uh, it could be griffin because griffin is a mythical animal. You have a lion uh, body and also the beak of a, an eagle and also the wings. So it's uh, you find it in the Greek world and also Egyptian world and everywhere. Uh, Shriya, can you can you hear me? Hello. So you are audible. I think ma'am is having some trouble with her network. Ah, okay, right. So, with her. But you are audible, so you can continue. But that's fine. Okay. So um, um, uh, that part is then also today I showed uh, these mythical animals in Greek and Roman world. Uh, so, you know, the, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about the... Um, 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 the, the, the dry, I mean, the makara, makara notion of it. I mean, makara has it's a very complicated notion. It can come from China and other places and also from India. But I'm talking, I'm talking about the hybrid animals that I showed you with a like type, I'm like tritons with a fish tail or a snake tail. 
and also sometimes half human, half animal, sometimes fully animal, and then the headdies of another one. Now, for example, the, um, the early early makaras uh, in, in Kandaranat, oh, not makaras, sorry, uh, um, uh, the, the dragon-like figure, uh, makara, yes, yeah, sorry, makaras. Um, it can be a crocodile, a crocodile head, and also can be a part of a uh, like in Sanchi Stupa number two, the, the most ancient one. So you have two, three animals joined together. So that notion is there. So Gryphon is one of them. Gryphon is like that. So you have then you have an animal on one side, and also the human being. So it, the the possibility is there are all many animals together. Now, for example, if you look at the Makaras of Sri Lankan art in the 7th, 8th centuries, I mean, it's a combination of crocodile mouth, uh, the feathers of a, a, a feathers of a, a, a peacock, uh, ears of a monkey, uh, the, the tooth or the defense of a, uh, of a wild boar, um, and also many, many other animals uh, together. So that's that's the I mean later version of it. So that's this notion of composite animals um, is found in um, early Greek art and also I'm certain it would have come to Indian art. So earliest form, if you ask me, what is the earliest form? Hybrid animals or monster-like animals you find in Indian art. You have to go to Sanchez to for number two so far. All right, oh, Shreya, you are back. You disappeared all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. I temporarily uh, so, lost network, sir. Right, that's fine. Okay. So I, I think I have answered, but please ask her to contact me. I can give you more evidence on that. Uh, so it's quite interesting to study that. Um, um, I tell you frankly, I haven't, I, I haven't done much research on it on Indian context that she's working on, but I can give you plenty of examples from China, from the Greek and Roman world, and also early Indian art, like in, uh, like in Saji. If we have to start everything from Bharat and Sanchi until we find a more ancient uh, uh, monument. Totally agree on that, sir, because whenever it comes to Indicata, I think you can't start with any other place. You have to have that backup with Bharat and Sanchi. So whether the secular sculptures or the mythical elements or all kinds of creatures, really. Also, to extend some gods, I think yeah. they're can best be explained when you look at these two particular supers. Super, yeah. So we have uh, another question. Robin Thomas says, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Thank you for being here. I wanted to inquire if it would be possible to access this talk later on. Yes, it will be uploaded online, provided it's perfectly okay with sir. Oh, and yes, yes. we'll and be sharing the link with you, sir. If somebody wants the PowerPoint, you can just convert into a PDF and send. I mean... I mean, the, everything I showed you today, they're all published. Um, I mean, even if they're not published, anybody can access. I, mean, I have no uh, jealousies or jealous or anything. <laughs> science, science, science is for humanity. So we've shared all your previous presentations. We'll be sharing this one as well. And we'll be trying to process it tonight itself so that we don't really keep you away from the talk. So in case you missed it or had to leave early, we yeah. are still going to present it to you. Right. So the Next question, sir, is according to some articles, goddess Taiki is seen holding a rudder of a ship in her hand, which signifies that she's directing the world. And in this art, Tara is associated with navigation. So she is the closest goddess to Taiki who also directs her devotees. So is there any chance that the development of Tara was facilitated by the cult of Taiki? Yeah, there are, there are uh, many, many many things in the questions. The person who asked the question uh, should be very intelligent and should know many things about it, right? So the, the It's Tamina, Nidhi again, sir. Huh? Who? It's Nidhi again. And Nidhi Patel? Nidhi Patel. Oh my God, yes, it's a wonderful question. So, um, uh, so Taiki, um, uh, first of all, of course, is city goddess, right? The, like this sculpture that I showed, which is in the Vatican Museum. So she she can have I mean there are you have the Taiki and the Fortuna. Fortuna should have a, a, a cone of abundance filled with fruits. So that's the prosperity. Taiki should have a, a, what you call a, 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 a crown with towers, which represents the uh, the, uh, uh, the the city. 
all the cities were um, fortified in ancient Greece those days, right? So that's one thing. And then the rudder, you know, for the directions, it comes, but it never appears in Gandhara not because it it it. I mean, of course, Gandhara had so many, uh, so many, um, uh, so many rivers. Apart from the sculptures which are in the Cleveland Museum that I showed them, uh, there you have the maritime gods with the others, but it's not the same same conception. Now to come to the Tara, uh, in the Greek world, the goddess of navigation is really Aphrodite, the Venus, what we call Aphrodite in, in, in Greek um, and Venus in Latin. So she was the real, real. I mean, Poseidon was a bad god. I mean, he's the god who destroys ships, but um, Aphrodite has always this loving, side of her so she was one and of course there were others so there are many stories i wrote in one of the articles where she intervenes when the people are in trouble aulikiteshwara and tara as i said last time they have they became uh, i mean of course aulikiteshwara was the healer of uh, diseases and on the other side tara as the concert played the same role but tara became very popular to what extent you know, when we when call it Guanyin in Chinese art, I mean, it's a female as appearance of architecture. So uh, then you have the story of Manimekala in Indonesia, where the sailors were saved. So Tara becomes, but it's much, much later. We cannot date Tara as the protector of mariners before the seventh century. Maybe the tail end of the sixth century. Tara appears before, for example, there are majors of Tara um, uh, in uh, in Gandhara, about fifth, sixth century. But Tara, like the one in Orissa, which is in, um, uh, I'm trying to find, it's not Kandakid, it should be um, the, the museum. Uh, anyhow, in Andhra Pradesh, one of the one of the biggest sites I will come to my mind later. So where you have the Ashtamaha Bay of Tara, where she is protecting. So it, I mean, if Sri Lanka did, I mean, was not occupied by the Cholas, we should have had Tara more in Sri Lanka playing the same role. What happened in Sri Lanka was Tara was replaced by Patini, right? Uh, Kandagi. Uh, it's a very another important important tradition. So, the, the, so that's absolutely truth in what Nidhi says, that these things are, uh, there is a continuation of these traditions. And of course, with the time and with your, um, with, uh, with your religious, uh, religious motives, and I think they, things can get, uh, uh, get amalgamated and get mixed. And they can be, I mean, this is what we call you absorb and you create something else. It's not, it's not a copy and paste. Sometimes in Roman art, you have the Greek element, you just, they copy it, absolutely. The ones that I showed you, the Lacon group, where the Trojan priest was punished by Poseidon by said it's next. It is a Hellenistic sculpture. It's the same thing Taiki, but what they do is they reproduce the same, same statue. It is copy and paste like we do we today. But there are other parts also, you absorb one element and you develop into something else. This is the whole question that the other person asked about, I don't know, it's Nidhi or somebody else. It was um, regarding the, uh, the, the Gryphon. It is Shalabandika that you were talking about. So there are so many things in a different context because it's not, we are no more in a Greek context. When, when, the, uh, when the Buddhist art developed in Gandhara, Greeks were not ruling there, right? But Greeks elements were there. But they all were, but one thing we are sure of, there were thousands and thousands of Buddhists in that area. So the, 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 the Buddhism was the predominant religion in that area. So they take a Buddhist story and use Greek iconography and narrate to the people. So it's, it's very easy now today, if you go to Sri Lanka and see these Maras attacks, these paintings of the 18th, 19th century, you see a British soldier aiming a gun, gun at the Bodhisattva. I have seen nowhere, or I have heard nowhere, and nobody's asking how come there is a gun. But in Buddha's times, there were no guns. But the, the message goes through because the worst enemy in the 19th century for India and Sri Lanka were the British soldiers. 
So it's a it's a it's a very very interesting message that you give. And if you if you put in Gandharana, the Scythian soldiers wearing the heavy armor and the Greek soldiers with their helmet and thorax and other things, so they understand. Oh, our enemies were the Buddha's enemies. That's a fascinating perspective, sir. So uh, we do have a lot of questions still for it, but I also remember that you've just come back from a conference and it's been very hectic for you. So would you want me to continue or should we take it up we'll the next take, uh, if, uh, We'll take another two or three questions and then, uh, I mean, they can always write to me, uh, right? I, I mean, it depends on you, please, it's your... No, entirely your call, sir. I'm ready to take yeah, these take, questions yeah, we'll take, if you are. Yeah, okay. Take two or three questions. All right. So the next one we have is by Purbasha Mukherjee. She wants to know how did the Buddhist iconography affect the jewelry of the Gandhara region? And did this jewelry depicting symbols function as some sort of talisman or amulet? Ah, very good question. Um, again, <laughs> very intelligent crowd. <laughs> so um, um, uh, most of the jewelry depicted on Gandharana compared to, for example, um, I don't know whether you have seen the book by Ponacha on Karagana Halli Stupa, which was I mean, recently excavated. Um, it's very important because they are, they are not Greek, they are Indian, right? Um, and also in science, there is a mixture of things. And when you look at the jewelry in Andhrat, it's also different. But in Gandharana, most of the jewelry Right, they are Greek, and also the way that the chains are made. You can see Bodhisattva wearing in this song, very rich, uh, 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 very rich uh, necklaces and uh, earrings and other things. So those um, uh, those are Greek, right? Um, and also amulets are there. If you if you look at the uh, Bodhisattva images, even Siddhartha as a Bodhisattva, and also. Um, uh, much less Maitre because he was a Brahmin. But if you see our reputation, they have these amulets and everything. Even the Upavita, right, has these amulets. So it's a, it's quite interesting the way they look like they almost they are, they are made Greek. Made Greek means made uh, according to the traditional uh, Greek techniques. Uh, sorry to come back to me again. I wrote another article on on the Greek jewelry uh, found in um, uh, found in uh, Central Asia. Well, you can see the Greek elements in that. I mean, also these bracelets with the, you know, like a turning thing, spiral thing, uh, with uh, imitating snakes and other, other elements. So, um, um, so the most, mainly the Bodhisattvas, also Dodana and even Buddha, but not Buddha's Bodhisattva before becoming the Buddha, they all wear that. And also the amulets, uh, it comes as a part of the Brahminical Vedic tradition. I mean, it's, I mean, so um, the way Maitreya is depicted is, uh, I mean, he's very rarely uh, uh, shown as a rich, uh, rich uh, bodhisattva, a um, rich uh, uh, prince. Arugiteshwara, yes, but since he's an ascetic, he has got the ascetic uh, elements, the things that he's wearing and all that, and also the Brahmins are done like that. So it's, um, it's quite interesting to see different elements in it. Um, the rich people, nobles, kings, royals, and also the Bodhisattva, they had fabulous jewelry on this, uh, on this respect. Yeah. And they are different from Sanchi, Kanagandali, and other traditions. Thank you, sir. Uh, jewelry has also been something that I have been researching on as a side-by-side -side thing. So while I look at sculptures, I also try to look at jewelry. And to me, what I found very interesting was if you go into the Western fringes of India today. So including parts of Jammu that sort of uh, have the same area as Pakistan. And then you go to the parts of Himachal Pradesh that share a border with Pakistan. You find quite a lot of these jewelry, specifically hoop earrings. So yeah. there are jewelries, there's specifically the red beaded hoop earring that you find quite a lot in Gandhara, yeah. which you were written about. And you find a few articles from Pakistan written about it. Yeah. That was also found in this region traditionally. And yeah. it's found it's still something that people wear and share and then pass down different generations yeah. which i find very interesting also the spiral bands that you see that you talked about yeah. that some yeah. still find in himachal pradesh quite a lot so those makar headed torque like figurines but they wear it around their wrists that's very 
commonly found in Himachal Pradesh, which was very surprising to oh, me. Yes. Doing how it first comes from Gandhara. Gandhara. Yeah, I mean, it's very, I mean, as you said very intelligently, I mean, we have to look at Jammu Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, and also what's happening in Peshawar, and also, uh, you know, Kaila, I mean, sorry, um, not Kailash, Kalash, Kalash region, north of Swat Valley. So, to, I mean, there is a continuation. I mean, it's very interesting if you just compare those with what is what you find in Kerala or in Tamil Nadu, they're different. And also the use of metal um, in, in South India, as you know, they, they used to have a lot of lead, but in, uh, in, uh, in northern uh, northwest frontier and also Pakistan and also northern, uh, south, uh, northern part of India, the, they have the more tendency for precious metal like gold and gold and silver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's very interesting. And also the motives, as you correctly said, they are different too. And, and also the you have to look at the pendants. The other other uh, the, I'm sorry I forgot that before I forget. The other thing is the torque, which is a very oh. what you call the tight necklace here. So if you if you look at some of the uh, bodhisattva, you have a torque and then you have a longer one and then you have a very long one. And when you come a little later in the chronological order, they have something like a vanamala. Vanamala become also a uh, jewelry. It's just quite interesting to, um, uh, to to see the evolution of of these things. Of the, of the jewelry they are, they are really beautiful absolutely absolutely they're amazing and it's so fascinating to see that these jewelries still live on in these cultures yeah. so you know you have the areas like malana in himachal pradesh that yeah. talks about being descendants of alexander so this very close village and they only marry with each other because they say we are descendants of alexander right. so yeah. if you look at their jewelry it's still very very greek in nature yeah. and it's it still retain that element of Gandhara, which you see in a museum, in a Bodhisattva image, like you said. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to take three more questions, sir, okay. from the this time. So this one's by the Dutta. He says, could you tell us about the role, if any, played by the dynasties of Odi and Aparacha in patronizing and creating Buddhist images using Hellenistic iconographic styles? That I can't answer um, uh, <laughs> for the simple reason I have not worked and I, I for my, I mean, with little knowledge I have, I don't see any uh, anybody start um, uh, on, on, during this period. Um, it depends on whether you are talking about the Gujarat Bombay area or whether you are talking about southern part of the uh, Indus River. So even the uh, southern part of the Indus uh, 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 River is, I mean, the, the basic Gandharan art, if you start in Pakistan today, it's mainly Saidu Sharif, right? And then uh, Peshawar, Mardan, Taxila, uh, that's, that's the area. So southern part, even Lahore, you don't, in Lahore is very, very close to New Delhi, as you know, and Lahore, you don't find where they start. And if you go to the um, uh, southern part of Indus, uh, Indus River, you don't find that. So it's uh, maybe my ignorance, to my knowledge, I don't see anybody's sculptures belong to uh, this, this period and this locality. If I find, I will write to you. Uh, and I, I have to be very honest because I haven't, I haven't looked for it. So I'm I'm going to look for it, but um, I the vague idea I have is there's nothing to uh, nothing really to to discuss. Oh, I'm, unless we find you you find certain things much later tradition. Um, uh, for uh, for example, you get uh, things also that I published. That's the uh, the Mahayana sculptures. Mahayana sculptures you find six seven centuries, but it's very difficult to say. It's Mahashatrapa, so others. It's quite difficult. Once again, something is coming back to my head. The other, other one is you have to look into Kanaganahalli. In Kanaganahalli, you have the, the kings of these dynasties depicted along with the Satavahanas, right? So that, um, and the kings are depicted as well. So I'm, I'm revising what I said now, because this question I didn't expect. So, um, um, so but, but you should find uh, the, the publication uh, by the big book by Tunacha and also followed by Monica Sin very recently, with a very interesting book. There, I mean, yeah, there are depictions of kings, right? Of, of the 
um, of the Satavahana dynasty and also the Mahashatrapas and others, and also the Kumpis. These things were studied by uh, Professor Oscar von Lilluber. And there you see something, right? it's not Gandhara, it is the continuation of Andhra art from, uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast as a result of the Satavahana dynamics of trade. So that's that. So I mean, if really want to know more about it, so I, I I come back to what I said. There is something Buddhist, but it is not Gandhara, right? Right. Thank you so much, sir. So the last question now is from Arun Kumar Yadav, and interestingly, he's from Nalanda University. So he Good. wishes to know whether in okay. Who is depicted more frequently in Gandhara art? Is it Anand or Mahakashyap? Or is it Sariputra and Moglyana? And depiction of Anand and Mahakashyap is very common in Chinese art, but they're not very common in Indian art. So any reason behind this? Uh, it's a very, I mean, it's a good question and a question very difficult to answer. Ananda and Mahakashyapa appear, they both appear during, uh, during the passing away scene, Mahaparinirvana scene. We identify Mahakashyapa because, um, I mean, he's old and he has, a, I mean, some sort of a stick too. And also he has, sometimes he's with the person who is holding the flower. You know the story. When Buddha passed away, Ananda was there and he was weeping and he was completely out because he never expected, because he also made a mistake as, you know, Buddha wanted to stay more and he didn't get the message because Mara was frightening him. So that's something. So he was very sad. So Mahakashipa was away. So, so what happened was when Buddha was about to be cremated, uh, his, uh, the fire didn't uh, lit the, the, the cremation, I mean, with the, the, uh, the, the body. So people were asking why it's happening. So it is because Mahakashipa was not there. Mahakashipa was away. When he was with another 500 monks, uh, a Brahmin comes with a flower. It is a heavenly flower. So he asked what happened. He said these flowers uh, fell down from the sky when Buddha passed away. So he knew that Buddha passed. So he comes, and then he comes. The, I'm especially I discussed this again in my latest book where I, um, so Mahakashyapa came, and then when he came in Chinese art, the person I don't know this very intelligent uh, student, student. So I mean lecturers have very good question. In the Chinese art, you get it because it's a very famous episode when Mahakashyapa wanted to pay tribute to the Buddha, uh, Buddha's body was inside the coffin. And what happens was Buddha pushed the feet out of the coffin so Mahakashyapa could embrace the feet. So these sculptures I published, I mean, I, I'm not the first person, Monica Singh did a wonderful study on that, looking at the Kisil paintings and also I mean, all the Silk Road paintings, where you see the episode of Mahakashyapa coming. So in that, you have, uh, you have one and but apart from that, you don't, it's very, I mean, you see Buddha you now, the stupa I showed you, there are many monks. So we have the tendency if the person is old and little bit, you know, um, uh, uh, looking like a Brahmin. So we have the tendency to say he's, he's Mahakashipa. So Ananda is from Buddha Shatri family. So he has a different morphology, but it's also guesswork. But only place where we can be absolutely sure is the, you have the, the conversion of Kashyapas and the conversion of Mongolian and others. And also it's definitely we are sure that we can identify most of the disciples in the Paranirvana scene, but they are not as rich as, as the person asked, who asked the question correctly said in Chinese art. Thank you so much for the answer, sir. I think this has motivated us to look even deeper into things. Yeah. and. I think with that, we come to an end with the questions. And those of you who do have questions which they want to be addressed, we are still going to be here on the 19th for the second part of the talk. It's not related, but it's still Gandhara. So feel free to post those questions then if you don't have any on that day. But I'm sure that day is going to be just as riveting and thought-provoking as our lecture tonight. Yeah, so, since you have done so much of studies about the gender studies <laughs> and publications, I'm sure you'll be very much. It's a very interesting story about a bhikshuni. Um, so uh, I hope I will be able to discuss, have a, I mean, it's a different kind of discussion about philosophy and attitude towards women and gender problems. 
in Buddhism. We're really looking forward to it, sir. There's just so much in that particular topic also that we look forward to explore with, with you. So uh, thank you so much once again, sir. Thank you so much for coming here to thank you so specifically much. for all days yeah. because uh, I know how tired you were and how I know how much you'd been traveling and no, things I'm never just tired. so hectic and you still agreed to do this. <laughs> And I think I feel very honored, but also very indulged. I feel like that, you know, I feel like a favorite student sometimes because all I need to do is ask you and you're so ready to do a lecture with us. So just because you keep saying it every time you don't want to monopolize the talks, we'd be very happy to let you monopolize them because there's just so much that we learn from you every time you speak to us. So be it coins, be it Kandhara sculptures, or be it Bodhisattva and his imagery in general. I think all of us, and I speak here for the entire research wing, as well as people who join us regularly, that I think all of us have learned so, so much. We feel so honored to have you among us, and we look forward to doing even more sessions with you. But with that, for everybody who's here tonight, we urge you to register for the talk on the 19th. There will be a separate registration for it. Research wing members at Speaking Archaeologically will obviously be attending it as a compulsory part of their syllabus. But with the rest of you, uh, I'll send you the link to the form and you'll need to register for it yet again. Make sure you state your reasons for attending clearly so that we do accept you as a guest within the research wing talks. So thank you so much once thank again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shia. And thank you to all of you for intelligent questions and for the discussion. And we look forward to having you back very, very soon. Thank Take you care, very sir. Much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.